I am Anviksha, a resident of Vasant Vihar, and a very good afternoon to the August gathering present here. The Delhi afternoons, thankfully, are still not absolutely hot and humid, and we really appreciate you all taking out time on this leisurely Saturday afternoon for this absolutely fascinating book discussion on the great Hindu civilization. We have today with us the prolific writer of this book, Sri Pavan Verma. And leading the conversation with him is Ms. Shoma Chaudhary. A little, uh, sir, may I please request the two of you to take your place on the dais. Mr. Pavan Varma is a writer, a well-known TV commentator, a former diplomat, and till recently, an MP in the Rajya Sabha. He served at, as India's ambassador to several countries, including Bhutan, where he was conferred Bhutan's highest civilian award, the Druk Thukse, by His Majesty. He was the director of the Nehru Center in London, official spokesperson of the Ministry of External Affairs and Director General ICCR. He was a press secretary to the President of India. He was an advisor to the Chief Minister of Bihar. He was conferred an honorary doctoral degree for his contribution to the fields of diplomacy, literature, culture, and aesthetics by the University of Indianapolis. He has authored over a dozen best-selling books, including Adi Shankaracharya, Hinduism's Greatest Thinker. This book was awarded the Atta Galatta at the Bengaluru Literature Festival for the best book of non-fiction. We're truly honored to have you amongst us, sir. And leading the discussion with him is Ms. Choma Chaudhary, an award-winning Indian journalist, editor, and curator. She has been awarded the prestigious Ernest Hemingway Award for Political Journalism, the Mumbai Press Club Award for Political Journalism, the Ramnath Koenka Award, and the Chameli Devi Award for Best Woman Journalist. She is also a reputed moderator who has hosted more than 500 conversations on stage, interviewing the most cutting-edge minds globally on politics, policy, economy, business, science, cinema, literature, sports, and media. She was the managing editor of Tehelka, the editor-in-chief of Catch News, a digital news platform, and most recently, she co-founded and was the director of Algebra, the Arts and Ideas Club, a forum for live critical conversation to spark new ideas and challenge perspectives on issues that impact human life. Thank you so much for agreeing to be here today, ma'am. Thank you. Now, before we delve a little deeper into the discussion with sir and ma'am, what is the great Hindu civilization? What do we understand when we hear this term? It might be redundant for some, in vogue for others. While some of us may be fanatic about the past, others may look at it as the way forward. But like our chief guest, Dr. Karan Singh said yesterday, there are many perspectives, many truths of one reality. Ekam sad vipra bahuda vadanti, which is what we will aim to understand today. The relevance for it us today, the Hindu civilization has had and still has all the aspects that are related to the theme of our lit fest today. Peace, prosperity, art, and culture. So without further ado, let us delve deeper into understanding about the Hindu civilization with Dr. Pavan Verma and Ms. Shoma Chaudhary. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for, for introducing us and thank you Vasan Vihar Club for having us. It's nice to be here on a Saturday afternoon. I'm uh, very excited to be here in conversation with Pavan. We have an old Jugalbandi going between the two of us and uh, it's always fascinating to speak with him. Uh, in addition to the way he was introduced, for me, Pavan actually is the epitome of his own book because his argument in the book is that 
the Hindu civilization is really equivalent to the fabulous Hindu mind. And Pavan really represents that because he has that kind of kaleidoscopic, curious, ever-searching quality to him. So I wanted to give him that salute before we begin. So Pavan, you know, you've already been introduced, so I'm not going to get into the book, but the central thesis of your book uh, is interesting because first of all, it's also your persona. It's typically the most provocative, angry, polarizing conversations today are between liberals and Hindutva, you know, what's Hinduism, what's Hindutva, liberal, secular, you know, that's the canvas of polarization. Here you are someone who's considered a liberal, secularist, pluralist, taking on your own brethren, you know. So what is the heart of your argument against liberals where the Hindu civilization question is concerned? Thank you, Shoma, for that initial tribute. And let me say how happy I am to be back again at the Vasant Vihar Lit Fest, which is becoming quite a landmark uh, in Delhi. And I want to thank General Prasad and his team for inviting me. Of course, I, I live in Vasant Vihar, so I take partial ownership. Uh, oh, let me answer your question. This book, The Great Hindu Civilization, was criticized by the liberal left lobby and also criticized by the right-wingers, which convinces me that I must have been doing something right. Uh, the short point of the book is this, that uh, in recent times, if you talk about our ancient past, which is marked by great antiquity, by continuity, by assimilation, by diversity, by peaks of unparalleled refinement, if you investigate that past, you are somehow immediately conflated with being a Sanghi. In other words, you are glorifying the ancient past and therefore glorifying Hinduism and therefore strengthening the ultra-Hindu extremist elements who would like to believe that Indian civilization is essentially a Hindu civilization. And I take a middle path. I say, for a country that was colonized by the British for close to three centuries, much of our past has been lost from us in our own memory. And to revisit it is not to glorify Hinduism, but to recognize some of the legitimate achievements which very few civilizations in the world have achieved. Whether it be in the field of philosophy and metaphysics, in music and dance, in literature and poetry, in political science and many other areas, India was the benchmark of excellence for millennia. We are talking now of a past which latest research shows goes back at least 5,000 years before the Christian era. At least. And there are many views on that. So to recognize that, is a legitimate pursuit and to dismiss that pursuit merely because you will in the process glorify your Hindu past is I believe an illiberal reaction. You can do more and many of us in our education system, in our lives don't know. They don't know the kind of religion, the kind of civilization, I will not say even religion. You do not know 
of its refinements. And when I was researching this book, and of course I've written a book on Adi Shankaracharya, on Tulsi Das's Ramcharit Manas, on Krishna. Apart from beginning, my first book being my biography of Mirza Ghalib. So, the point I'm trying to make, Shoma, is that there are historians, I count Amartya Sen among them, who believe that any attempt to talk of the Hindu past, which was the foundation of our civilizational state, but not the only reality, any attempt to do so is to strengthen the forces that seek to glorify India's Hindu entity. And I disagree uh, with that. I, I just wanted to intervene there. I think the, the heart of the argument is not necessarily only about a reluctance to glorify a Hindu past, but that it has got entwined with an oppression of Muslims in present day time, you know. And so that political interpretation of Hinduism uh, as a majoritarian, you know, a dominance is what makes people uncomfortable about examining the glory of the past. But you know? if you examine the past, you draw exactly the opposite conclusion. Hinduism as a way of life and as a philosophy and as a religion is eclectic, inclusive and dialogic. I mean, which other religion can you speak of whose Mahavakya in the Rig Veda is what was mentioned just now, Ekam Sat Bipraha Bahuda Vadanti. The truth is one, wise people call it by different names. When I entered parliament in the Raj Sabha, when I entered, I was surprised that right at the entrance is written Udhar Charitanam Vasudheva Kutumbukam. For the big hearted, the entire world is a family. Once again, one of our Mahavakyas. Another Mahavakya. Ano Bhadra Kritavoyantu Vishwata. Let good thoughts flow to me from all directions. Hinduism is an inclusive religion and it is Sinatan precisely because of this conquering eclecticism. And that is the lesson we need to draw today that when you mutilate a religion which does not believe in exclusion, which does not believe in bigotry, which does not believe in hatred, which does not believe in violence prompted by religion, you are devaluing Hinduism and therefore, we need to know more about the past. I yes. mean, how many of yes. you know that in Hinduism, the Upanishads are a dialogue. The Bhagavad Gita is a dialogue. These are the foundational texts of Hinduism. The Brahm Sutras are a dialogue in the sense that in the commentary of this remarkable book, the Brahm Sutras, aphorisms, the tippani, the tika, the commentary will always include the point of view of the opponent. How many of you know that there are not one but six systems of Hindu philosophy? Nyay, Vaisheshik, Sankh, Yogya, Puru, Vimansh and Uttar Vimansh. And technically, almost all of them can be called atheist. They are not talking about God. They are talking about what could be the ultimate truth. That is the search. When you define Brahm in the Advait philosophy, you are not talking of deity. You are talking of that cosmic consciousness, that pulsating cosmic consciousness that pervades the universe, which is Akhand, which is Adrisht, which is Achintya which is uh, Purna, which is uh, uh, Nirvisheshchin Matram, undifferentiated consciousness, which is Sarvavyapi, omnipotent, and which is Nirguna, at, without attributes. That is the reality. And then we have descent. Hinduism teaches us the validity of descent. 
There is a school of thought within Hinduism called the Charvaks. By the way, a very sophisticated philosophy developed by Brihaspati also several centuries, centuries before the birth of Christ, which is a materialist school, which says that the Vedas are rubbish, which many regard in Hinduism as revealed texts. As you know, there is Shruti and there is Smriti. This is Shruti. And yet the Charvaks are part of Hinduism. So it is a religion that teaches you to accommodate, to, to allow dissent and to include rather than exclude which is the only reason that of the great civilizations of the past Hindu civilization is the only one which in spite of setbacks and vicissitudes has managed to survive today if not in the original form but as a way of life for 80 crore people and many, many beyond it. So, to I mean when you go into it we were the country that developed the theory of aesthetics. The West used to believe that the term aesthetics was developed in the 17th century by a Britisher. If you read the Natya Shastra of Bharat, written 300 years before the birth of Christ, the first compendium in the world on arts alone, there is a chapter on it, on Rasa. The notion and concept of aesthetics so it was a very sophisticated civilization. Now what is the problem, Shoma, is that we also have, unfortunately, a Dinanath Bhatra school of historians who in their attempt to glorify this Hindu past actually demean it. According to them, there were aeroplanes, that cars used to ply, that we had in vitro fertilization. And in doing so, Instead of paying tribute to what were legitimate and perhaps unprecedented and unparalleled achievements, we trivialize it. So you have to find a way by which you understand the past and accept the present after knowing what it is. So, Pavan, I wanted to bring you in here. You know, so there are several aspects to his book. He looks at the impact of... Uh, you know, the, uh, the Muslim period, the Mughal period, its impacts on the Hindu mind because the subject of his book is the Hindu civilization. There's the impact of British colonization uh, on the Hindu mind. And if you bring it down to a kernel, he thinks, the, you know, the Muslim period took away the Hindu spine and the British period took away the self-esteem and soul, you know. So we, we're going to uh, approach that, those topics, difficult topics to speak about. But before that, Pavan, I wanted you to share, reinforce, you know, you've talked about some of the splendor of Hinduism and the Hindu civilization, but at its heart is, and you, you use a beautiful phrase, what really distinguishes it is that Hinduism as a system of thought was born out of the audacity of thought, you know, which really is distinct from any other, most other religious systems look at certitude, whereas ours begins, or Hinduism begins with inquiry. And so, uh, you know, I wanted you to talk about this audacity of thought. Uh, start from the Rig Veda, you know, that at the very source, the first verse, what distinguishes it from all other systems? Well, partly I have spoken about the audacity of thought when I spoke of Brahm. Uh, I've spoken about the six systems of philosophy. I recommend to you to try and understand the depth and profundity of thought. I mean, the Rig Veda, as you all know, the Nasidiya Sukt in it, begins not as a fiat. It is an invitation to explore, to imagine, to ask, to interrogate. What is this reality? There are no ten commandments in Hinduism and I have great respect for all other religions. The entire notion of dharma in Hinduism is quite remarkable. In the Hindu worldview, 
द फोर पुरुषार्थ धर्म अर्थ काम मोक्ष अ कन्फ्यूशली बैलेंस्ड लाइफ द फोर आश्रम्स आई मीन देर आर सो मच इन टर्म्स ऑफ ओरिजिनल थॉट बट आई वुड लाइक टू आंसर योर क्वेश्चन ऑन द इम्पैक्ट ऑफ Islam yeah. and Christian I'm I'm going to come to that Pavan I was just going to uh, sort of ask you to emphasize the excitement or the interest of what I posed to you was that uh, you know the other aspect of the Adi Shankara book for example you've been drawing attention to how some of the spiritual hindu thought you know the cosmology becomes uh, there's quite a parallel now with uh, advances in physics you know so that Rigveda's first verse is is really exciting because it's describing Uh, a state of the cosmos you know of of what was there in the beginning and that is unlike you know in christianity you say in the beginning there was light the word you say that in you know in islam also there's a revealed religion here the first verse of the rigveda speaks of the nature of the cosmos in a way which perhaps even physics will bear out so that's why i wanted you to share that with no, the audience no i i can't don't have time in this session but i think i have spoken before here on my book adi shankaracharya and there is a chapter in it which says the remarkable validation of science now as i clarified in the beginning i am not dinanath batra but when you examine today at the cutting edge of new discoveries of science by the latest scientists in quantum physics in cosmology in neurology and then see how it corresponds to the notion of advait philosophy and the cosmic consciousness called brahm it's a chapter i would request you to read because the parallels and the endorsement are remarkable and have been acknowledged and great deal of research is going on in it so i don't have time to go into that because then that's a separate session sure. and vasant we are will not give me that much time okay so let let me bring you then to as i said that contentious topics of what was uh, you know the impact of the 600 years of muslim rule in india uh, again th there there's a liberal position which focuses on the kind of cultural interchange that there was the new syncretic personality that was created by that impact uh, there are others who want to focus on the destruction you know you are looking very squarely at the destruction in this book and as i said that's an interesting position for a liberal to do so one you know talk to us about that destruction and how do you distinguish yourself then from say a uh, hind uh, uh, card carrying hindutvavadi you see i don't believe it is productive to whitewash the past and i don't believe it is productive to be a prisoner of the past so when we had the turkic invasion if there are historians who try to make it out as though the invaders came in some kind of tourist bus of that time offered us some biryani and we gave them some puri alu and we developed a ganga jamuni tehzeeb overnight it did not happen like that there's no point in whitewashing history will durant calls it the bloodiest chapter perhaps in the history of the world there was a massive destruction of a very ancient and refined civilization there was destruction of of religious artifacts of temples of centers of learning and ruthlessly so i mean when the library in nalanda was burnt it burnt for a year because of the number of priceless manuscripts that had been stored in it the destruction was rampant we must accept it and if we try to whitewash it as was done by some historians whom i am not naming now for the well intentioned reasons after in the, in the aftermath of partition i can understand i can understand but you must acknowledge the past in order to transcend it and therefore i believe that you must recognize it 
for what it was and then wonder over why in spite of that we have managed to build a syncretic Ganga Jamuni Tezi which has in a sense brought together two cultures in spite of the degree of massive destruction, religious proselytization, religious hostility. And I will tell you why Hinduism still survived. You know, in Indonesia, it was a Buddhist country, there was a Muslim invasion and almost all of in Indonesia became Muslim. It did not happen in India. It did not happen in India because the reaction of Hinduism was in the face of the destruction of its principal centers and centers of learning and established structures of the perpetuation of that religion, the response of Hinduism was to take this religion to the masses and that happened to some, through something very remarkable. It's the, one of the finest phases of our history and that is the Bhakti movement. The Bhakti movement took Hinduism and its essential tenets in the language of the people to the masses and it happened not in one state. It happened through uh, Maharashtra, Bengal, in, in, the Nayars in uh, Alwars in the south, uh, the, the Lingayats, the Basavanna. It happened through Chandidas. It happened through Surdas. It happened through Tulsidas in the case of Ram. It happened in Maharashtra through Tukaram for 600 years. Hinduism, having lost some of its central focus, managed to survive because it just dispersed into the masses, not in an inaccessible Sanskrit imposition, but in the language of the masses, through kirtans, through pilgrimages, through tirat, through bhakti, through devotion. And so, that was a remarkable feature. But my whole point in this is that in South Africa, after it became independent, there was the horrendous history of apartheid. And what they did was to stress, to, to not to deny it, but to set up a truth and reconciliation mission where you accept the history and move on beyond it. Denial creates a backlash. You move on beyond it because the India of today is constitutionally and otherwise for purely pragmatic and practical reasons a multi-ethnic, multi-religious, plural country. And that reality cannot be changed unless we seek to destroy India. So, my position is that, now as a result of this, uh, as far as the British is concerned, I want to sum it up for shortage of time. You see, the success of colonialism is not your physical subjugation. It is the colonization of your mind. Which is why we are having this discussion in English today. Not that I have anything against English. The first thing the colonizer takes away is your language. And the British were very successful colonizers. They created in their own image an elite which Metcalf wrote precisely. Black in color and English in aspiration. And for a long while after 1947, that elite, the anglicized elite, came to power in India. And so the colonization of the mind has, made, has ruptured our past, our, our, our connection with our past. Even someone whom I, for whom I have great respect, Jawaharlal Nehru, believed in a modernity in largely Western terms. I mean, he used to refer to the past as the deadwood of the past. As if everything in the past was wrong. 
and move on now somehow towards a modernity defined by the West. So this is what colonialism did to us. So, so Pavan, if I may intervene here, uh, two questions. One is that, you know, in this entire enterprise that you're trying to put a spotlight on the undeniable destructions of th that period of Muslim rule, do you think that it's equally important you know, for that anger and for those who just hear about it in public discourse, not to bring it on to modern day, you know, Muslim Indian citizens which, who have absolutely nothing to do with what Aurangzeb did or, uh, you know, what Jahangir did or anyone did. Uh, do you think it's equally important to also focus on the fact that there was a lot of ferment? You know, you kind of dismissed it right now as like they didn't come in a tourist bus and feed each other biryani, but they're equally very strong historic incidents where you show that it was a lot of political exchange, you know, Muslims were fighting Muslims, Shivaji's grandfather was a part of a Muslim, uh, you know, Malik Ambar's army who was actually fighting Aurangzeb, uh, uh, sorry, fighting Jahangir, uh, the Vijayanagar kingdom, you know, Krishna Deva Raya's greatest enmity was with the Urissa uh, king, even more than with the Bahamani kingdom because there were caste issues there. And so Muslims and Hindus were constantly both allying with each, you know, having alliances with each other and fighting each other. And it was not as polarized as, you know, uh, an argument would make, which would say that Muslims were really uh, subjugating Hindus during this period. So do you think you do enough of that? And I think your enterprise of casting a spotlight on this is a liberal doing it is much better than a fundamentalist doing it. But do you think that there's one aspect of the argument missing in your book and when you're speaking publicly? Not at all, because I recognize the fact that in spite of the great degree of verifiable damage and destruction as a result of this invasion, which is acknowledged objectively by historians globally, except those who have a well-intentioned reason not to do so. I say, in spite of that, we have developed. Look at our music. We had Drupad, we have Khayal now. Look at our architecture. There are elements of both cultures. Look at our languages. There is an element of Persian, Urdu, Hindi in all our languages. Look at our cuisine. So, I am not denying all of that. I am saying recognize what happened and don't make it out to be as some kind of uh, initially Ganga Jamuni thing. It, it happened. And as far as uh, one king fighting another, that's at a political level. I am talking of culture. I am talking of civilization. Now, I, this is where I mean historical amnesia. How many of you know the achievements of Krishna Devarai. I would put him at the same level as Ashok and Akbar. One of the greatest kings of the last Hindu kingdom. A fair administrator. A secular administrator. Who had Muslims and Hindus in his court. A competent king. There is no mention in our books. What do you know about Thiruvalluvur? Who, who's, Thirukural is considered a Veda in the south. Full of wisdom. Uh, you know, we have a rupture with our history, which if we read will not make us intolerant and bigoted or necessarily aggressively supremacist, it will make us understand who we are, which will lead far more to the ultimate liberal cause that India is seeking to pursue, which is to be a plural, secular, multi-ethnic religion with a civilizational unity, but also a great deal of diversity. And that's why I criticize. Yep. You know, you brought up this idea for Hindu civilization. That's the other very polarizing question which says that was, Hin was India a Hindu civilization? You know, was there sacred geography? Was there an understanding of itself as a Hindu culture? Or is that, that something outsiders or the British posed upon uh, India? So that's again a question that people argue over a lot. 
what evidence would you give to show that this indeed was, uh, you know, geographically and culturally in the in the consciousness, a uh, Hindu civilization with many other streams in it? What you know? How would you make that argument? The greatest deceit the British convinced themselves about was that they came and made the concept of India, and until then we were just a collection of diversities. Please read the Purans. There is a already mapped out notion of Bharat Varsh, almost to an exactitude which defines it from Kanyakumari to the Himalayas. That's called the civilizational unity. You have, uh, if you stand like this in India, it's Krishna, whether it's in Manipur or whether it's in Kerala. Our texts, so much, if you look at, look at the manner in which Baisakhi, Sankranti, Pongal, you call them by different names, they fall around the same day. I can give you countless examples, some of which is mentioned. The fact that we were a civilizational unity is undeniable. The fact that we became a nation with a constitution happened in 1947. And there, the British were a catalyst by which, in one sense, we realized our own unity. And the pa partition was unfortunate, but nevertheless, that was, the, that was the essence of the civilizational unity of India. There's an interesting story. You know, I'm going to open this up to uh, audience questions. I don't know if we have time for that. Uh, but I just wanted to share a small anecdote, uh, which is fr from one of Pavan's books, is that even when Alexander came to India, you know, he thought he was floating around somewhere in Egypt and he sent out his spies to find out what is this land that he's arrived at. And at that time, it's one of his historians have written that they, the description that these spies gave was like Pavan just said, so precise that it could speak of the rivers, it could speak from Kanyakumari to Kashmir, from the east to the west. Of course, it included parts of uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan now. But that there was a very conscious sense of the sacred geography, as we call it, and that that geography was marked by a common idea of cultural, you know, gods, constructs of gods, which this entire region had. So, you know, it's, it's important to accept that. And then what is the lesson you draw from it? that do you want to become uh, polarizing, Semitic, uh, and majoritarian? Semitic, I mean in terms of a nationhood that's based on majoritarian ideas, or do you actually really draw those Hindu values and uh, construct ourselves as plural, inquiring, skeptical, absorbing? You know, I think that's the key contention that's really at you play know, here. The real point is, to put it briefly, and I cite a person for whom otherwise I have great respect, Dr. Amartya Sen. Now, he is passionately secular. So, any attempt to understand the antiquity of India, he considers as a glorification, uh, as a cons conspiracy as to glorify yeah. hmm. a, a Hindu civilization. But now today, modern research clearly shows that the old theory that the Aryans are supposed to have invaded India in 1500 BCE has been completely discarded. I mean, Dr. Upinder Singh, who is one of the greatest uh, authorities on ancient India, says she's the daughter of Dr. Manmohan Singh, she calls it rubbish. What we have discovered today as a result of that mysterious river Saraswati is that, and by the way, for this, geological, satellite, meteorology, uh, latest tools of science have shown that there was indeed a river which is described 72 times in the Rig Veda as a mighty and flowing river. There are 14 or so separate shlokas on the mighty Saraswati which flowed from the Himalayas to the sea. Now science shows that this river for 
a variety of reasons including possibly tectonic changes whereby its waters joined the Jamuna and the Sutledge. This river began to dry up and the scientists have discovered the Paleo, Paleo Channel from the Himalayas to the Arabian Sea. This river began to dry up sometime around 2500 BC to 2100 BCE. That 400 years. So if the Rig Veda has got hymns on the torrential and mighty and swirling river like a sea, like an ocean, it has to have been written when the Saraswati was in full stream. Therefore, that already predates this civilization on the basis of verifiable scientific, geological, historical evidence by 2000 years. Now, Amartya Sen dismisses that this is just an attempt to glorify Hinduism. He goes to the extent of saying that, you know, Panini, the great grammarian, he was from Afghanistan, he was not an Indian. Panini was born in present-day Afghanistan, which was then part of India, I mean, the Mauryan Empire. Uh, he says, why call it a Hindu period? Why not call it a Buddhist period? There was Buddhism for a thousand years. I have no objection to appellations, but all of us know that the foundational religion was Hinduism and there are so many overlaps with Buddhism and Jainism and Sikhism, which came later. But they were offshoots of Hinduism and there were kings, all verified, inscribed, documented, who part of the family went to the temple, part of the family went to the viharas of the Buddhists. So to say that no, why call it Hindu? Now this is the kind of liberal reaction which I cannot understand. But I criticize heavily the extremist form of Hinduism which breeds hatred, which is lumpen, which has become a law into itself. The fastest growing organization in the BJP is not the RSS. It's the Bajrang Dal. If you take one person from the Bajrang Dal, put him in a room and lock it and say, write one page on Hinduism, I guarantee you he or she will fail. But they are the new foot soldiers who have been used by the ruling government but today are no longer in their control. And therefore, I'll just finish with this anecdote on a particular function. The Tatreya Hosbele, who is the chief of the RSS, Mohan Bhagwat is the titular head, but the Tatreya Hosbele runs the RSS. He was sitting next to me, and there was a launch of uh, Ram Madhav's book on Deen De Alupadhyay, where I was also a speaker. And the ji turns to me and said, Bhavanji, I have read your great Hindu civilization Akshara. Bhavanji, I have read your book verbatim. Then, to my surprise, he names the page. He says, up to page 300 and something, you put forward our point of view in a way better than we can. But after that, you become, begin to criticize us. <laughs> Short point is, this type of extremism, this form of Hindu majoritarianism is playing with fire. Today we have in Punjab the beginnings of the rise again of a separatist movement. In one of his public interviews, Amritpal said, why don't you arrest those who talk about a Hindu Rashtra? When I talk about Khalistan. In other words, competitive religious nationalism can break this country. And it's not so simple to merely divide it on the basis of religious bigotry. I mean, even the Christian population of India, which is 2%, is more than the population of Greece and Hungary put together. You have 200 million Muslims. If they were in one geographical area, create a Hindu Rashtra. They live cheek by jowl across the country. 
25% of Kerala is Muslim, 30% of West Bengal is Muslim, 18% of Bihar is Muslim, 20% of UP is Muslim, 14% of Karnataka is Muslim, 12% of Tamil Nadu is Muslim. Do you want to create civil wars everywhere? And that is not the essence of Hindu civilization. Ekam sad vipraha bahuda vadanti. Yes, there are angst that the Hindus have, including minority appeasement in the past, including the overruling of the Shabano judgment by Rajiv Gandhi in order to appease a particular community. These are things to be looked at within the ambit of law and democratic politics, not by violence, not by hatred, not by bigotry. And that is the lesson we have to understand, that recognizing the past, moving beyond it, we live in a constitutional republic which is plural, multi-ethnic and multi-religious. And we have to live as a nation together. On that note, thank you so much, Pavan. You, you know, he has a wonderful phrase in his book called compressed cerebral energy. And he, as I said, epitomizes that. That's, I think, in 35 minutes, that's the most compressed cerebral energy you could hope to have on a Saturday afternoon. So thank you very much, Pavan. Um, I think we've overrun time. It's time for lunch. So unless someone has a very burning question to ask, I'm going to close this session down. Okay, there's one question. We'll take two questions and then we'll stop. Yes. Shuma, ma'am, more, more than a question, this is my objection to you using the term Muslim. Okay, my request is that you say Sunnis and or whatever Shias or whatever. Because Sunnis are also Hindus only, but they are there but for the grace of God go I. They have to become Sunnis. If they naturally become Sunnis. If they are with anybody, it's just a geographical thing. That they were this thing. So, uh, Muslims term to use hi nahi karna hai, mere khayal se toh. And um, also, uh, sir, I would like to also mention ki um, the Ten Commandments jo aap keh rahe hai ki wo inka hai, in loo ka hai, Israeli walo ka hai, jiska bhi hai, humare Devi Bhagwat mein Ten Commandments is mentioned. Not as Ten Commandments, humare mein Four Commandments hai. The Four Commandments aap bolenge toh mein bata dungi. But the Ten Commandments are mentioned as directions. One, two, three, four, they are mentioned uh, uh, as directions. Please sir. read. Sir. Please read my chapter, my yes, fairly long analysis on dharma yes, and sir. the highly sophisticated con concept of dharma that we have. We don't lack a normative moral framework, but mm -hmm. we contextualize what is right and wrong in the circumstances in which it is done, which is a very courageous position to take. As far as your point on Muslims, that's a point of view you have. I accept it. Any other question? One point or else, sir. That is that we say Hinduism, Hindus, Sanatani, Sanatani means West Voice, they also say that they call themselves Sanatis when they do things. So I want to emphasize you that our Hinduism is Mohandas Karamchandra, that everyone gives sin to God. So in the Bible, the doctrine of Matthew 5.44 is a magic wand. So ma'am, I'm so sorry. We can do this over lunch. I'm just going to pass the mic on to her. Just one thing, the key magic wand, this will solve all our law problems, our Russia, Ukraine problems also, our problems with this thing also. It's a winner thing. Thank you. 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 With you. <laughs> yes, okay. can we just pass the mic away to this? Uh, Matthew 5.44. All oh, right, yeah, thank okay. you so much. Uh, Mr. Varma, I'm greatly inspired to read your book. But, uh, you know, I represent the domain of education I teach in the university system. And uh, I want to ask you a very sort of uh, significant question. So, this Dina Nath Batra version of Hinduism has got translated into Indian knowledge systems and it has been made mandatory in school education and in university education. In two, in two states, Gujarat, no. Gujarat and Haryana. No, but now as that is already implemented, but now every university, including Delhi University, has been asked to introduce courses in it across the curriculum. So this is going to be slow indoctrination. 
and children in school are not going to be given an alternative worldview, which is the authentic worldview. What do we do as combative forces? As citizens, first of all, this is precisely what I am trying to raise my voice against. You are legatees of a great civilization. Understand through knowledge what it is so that you are not misled, misguided by this kind of historical triviality bordering on the comic. But if you have a government that is seeking to sabotage the authentic recognition of a great civilization and culture by this kind of garbage, we as citizens have a voice. And that voice should be expressed democratically. My book has been read by those who make policies. I just mentioned to you the head of RSS told me he's read it. So I make my point clear about Mr. Dinanath Batra and the kind of fantasies he seems to have. And so we have to make a fight. I'm sorry, there's no other way if a government refuses to understand the greatness of the civilization it hopes to represent and trivializes it, we as citizens have to fight it. On that note, I'm going to uh, end. Thank you very, very much, Pavan. I think it's important for, uh, you just mentioned the government, that when we're talking about uh, periods of history when the greatness of Hinduism was sabotaged, I hope that uh, you know, the, our modern day governments don't look at themselves in the pages of history as also having sabotaged the genuine cerebral energy of Hinduism. And Pavan is a defense against that. Thank you so much. Thank you all of you. What an absolutely invigorating discussion that was. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, ma'am, for this uh, amazing discussion. And uh, I think we've all understood where sir is coming from. And I think it's uh, safe to say that we understand that we have to understand the past to kind of and accept it to move forward. And uh, may I now request Neeraj Groverji to present a memento to our uh, guests. A token of our thanks and appreciation. Thank you so much.